Uh, well, so I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today on this webinar for the A-School Faculty Lecture Series. I believe this is our 10th talk. Um, and we are lucky today to have Bill Sherman, our Valmarana professor, and, a, and as well as Alexandra Valmarana, an alumna of our programs, um, to talk about the next Veneto and sort of both the look of the school and our programs moving forward, as well as personal experiences and thoughts about Venice and the area. Um, as we all know, it's been a lot in the news. And so with that, a little bit of uh, Zoom webinar etiquette. Um, as you all know, with the webinar, we can't uh, see or hear you, unfortunately, but we do want to take your questions and thoughts. So on the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A. And if you have questions throughout this, which we hope you do, um, please put it into the Q&A and we'll leave the chat to um, comments, thoughts, um, anything else that you want to share with Bill and Alex as we uh, talk for the next 45 minutes, hour, a little bit longer or so. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Maybe that's our cue, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, well, let me jump in. Can, uh, I guess there's no way for me to know that uh, everyone can hear. Um, but I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for, for joining us uh, today. It's a real pleasure uh, to uh, be able to speak with uh, Alex Belmarana uh, today and share a number of her experiences. Before we jump to that conversation, though, I'd like to offer a few um, thoughts and observations about the program and also for those who have not uh, heard directly yet about uh, what is happening with the Veneto probes, I'd like to provide a little background uh, to you and uh, where, where that is going. And I think as most of you on the call know, as many know that um, the programs are some of the oldest at the university, starting in the mid-1970s, uh, founded by Mario de Valmarana, and are able to, uh, and that we um, would have been, you know, it has taken uh, many forms over the years, and, uh, and since uh, Mario's retirement uh, in uh, the early 2000s, um, has uh, run under a number of different uh, formats within the schools. One, the core of the programs um, has been a, a multidisciplinary conversation and an investment and uh, engagement uh, with the Veneto that has really sp uh, spoken to the school's core values. And with the support of the, uh, of the alumni has been able to be offered uh, to the students in a way that is highly sustainable and uh, is allows the, the students to be able to participate without um, you know in spite of whatever financial resources they may bring this is particularly important now in conversations that are happening in the school about maintaining a, a school and a program that's accessible and open to all um, uh, in the school so we appreciate very deeply the support that many have offered uh, the Vicenza program uh, has continued uh, under the leadership of uh, Charlie Menefee uh, with a focus on drawing and study of the architecture of the Veneto uh, and continues uh, now uh, under the leadership of Luis Pancorbo uh, and Inez Robles Martin. Uh, that um, has uh, and then the, the Venice program is one that we have been reevaluating in a way, trying to put on a more sound long-term financial footing. And uh, as many of you may know, we did a reevaluation of it last year and relaunched the program as one that is from its earlier incarnation as one that was open primarily to architecture undergrads, now to be open to all students in the School of Architecture in their final year of study, whether undergraduate or graduate. And uh, to um, 
offer a full 15 credit semester, a portion of which would be taken in uh, Charlottesville, and, but with six weeks in Venice embedded in the center of it. We launched that and, as an offering uh, last winter and had 20 students sign up, which is actually a record number for the, uh, for the Venice program. Unfortunately, as you all know, um, the coronavirus uh, has changed all of our plans um, and the university has actually canceled all study abroad programs, uh, both for this past summer, uh, this summer, current summer, and for the fall semester. So um, we are reworking the program. I was to teach the program with Julie Bargman from the Landscape Architecture faculty and uh, working with a number of our colleagues uh, in, uh, in Venice and in the Veneto. Uh, but uh, in the new um, reality that we're all living in, uh, we made a, uh, an adjustment. Um, and Julie and I will both be offering design studios that will now be open to any students, uh, whether or not they had originally signed up for the program. Those who did sign up will have first choice. Uh, and we'll also be uh, offering a seminar. I'll be uh, teaching a seminar on Venice that's exploring many of the contemporary issues of, uh, of Venice. Um, I want to reiterate through that and how we're keeping this alive as a Venice project this year, um, even if not able to offer it as a Venice program, and uh, with the goal of being able to be back um, uh, next, uh, next year uh, in the Veneto um, and look forward to that, um, to that possibility. But I want to reiterate how critical and the Veneto are to the identity and the kind of core values of the School of Architecture and the kinds of issues. You know, Venice is um, a city with a deep cultural history of resilience and that is now on the front lines of climate change, which is an issue that we are all wrestling with now. It's a site for the study of urban form that's deeply intertwined with its landscape, with its region, and with its ecological systems, and has been had that kind of deep engagement. Um, for uh, nearly a thousand years um, and offers extraordinary lessons to us as we think about those kinds of issues um, as we move uh, forward. It's a site for the study of the history of architecture, clearly. Um, it's preservation and continuing cultural value and we'll touch on some of that in the discussions today uh, with Alex. And of course, it's a city of extraordinary uh, spatial complexity and richness and has been a cro crossroads for many cultures um, uh, over centuries now. Uh, and how we think about a uh, multi multicultural city, its institutions, its governance, and its architecture, and the, the character and nature of the public space where all those exchanges take place offers an extraordinary opportunity. So for dealing with both historical and contemporary questions and questions about the future of the city, it's an extraordinary case study for us. Um, and in a way, a, uh, a unique opportunity that's been made possible by the long-term generosity and engagement of the Balmorana family, as well as the support of so many alumni uh, over the years. Um, what I'd like to uh, do now, and, um, and again, to reiterate what um, I think Kim was mentioning, um, and she has put in the chat, um, uh, that uh, before she uh, was bumped off for some reason and now she's back on, uh, was to, for you, you're welcome to use the chat for ongoing comments and responses um, to the entire group during the course of our discussion today. And if you have questions for our Q&A session at the end, please put them in the, the Q&A um, uh, button, uh, under the Q&A button uh, that's uh, in your Zoom interface. And uh, Kim will be sorting through those as we go and will uh, be bringing those uh, back to us. But um, now I want to um, shift to introducing our primary speaker today, um, Alex de Balmarana. Um, she is, uh, she received, um, and many of you may know her already, but uh, look forward to this conversation. Um, 
she received her uh, Bachelor of Architectural History from the University of Virginia in 1996 and a Master of Science at the University of Bath School of Architecture and Engineering. Uh, she was a partner in the London architecture practice of Peregrine Bryant Architects, where she worked for over 20 years uh, and continues to consult with the practice. Her work includes both public and private sector projects, including work for UNESCO World Heritage Sites, the Crown Estate, the National Trust, the Landmark Trust, uh, the Governor General of Antigua, and private clients. Her work has taken her across Europe. Uh, the United States and the Caribbean, and has included an extensive range of ages and building types from environmental uh, new build to historic estates, residential to medical and educational sectors from the 13th century to 21st century buildings. Alexandra sits on the board of several international architecture and design charities. So she has an extraordinary background. And in addition, um, she was in Venice uh, this year uh, uh, with uh, her husband Francesco and children, um, and uh, living there uh, both in the aftermath of the uh, floods that occurred last um, last fall and at the beginning of the coronavirus and the lockdown that occurred um, this spring, um, kind of twin catastrophes uh, for the city. But I'd like to begin by asking Alex to, in a way, share her experiences and impressions of Venice. I know many of us have been curious about what it was like to be there, what it, uh, what it meant, and um, just to have a kind of firsthand account as a, starting point, as a starting point. And then we will dive into a number of issues that this raises for us for the future and uh, for um, opportunities uh, that we may um, uh, take on uh, with respect to our programs. So Alex, first, welcome. And uh, second, uh, would you like to sh share some of your impressions of having been in Venice uh, through this initial period? Phil and everyone, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be here and to talk to you. Um, the, you asked about our time in quarantine in, in Venice. We actually started outside of Venice in the Veneto still. Um, and many of you know that the word even quarantine comes from Venice and from the word quarantino, which means 40 days, which is traditionally uh, the isolation period that was required during plague period during Venice. And um, so I think we have a lot to learn from Venice and hopefully we're going to touch on those subjects even today. Uh, many of you know that the coronavirus started in Lombardy and then moved to a tiny little town in Vaux in the Veneto. And met, if any alumni are out there, you may have visited there because uh, Mario had a house there and Betty had a house there. And it's a very small town of 3,000. Um, and, but they managed to eradicate um, coronavirus within a month, which is pretty extraordinary and is possibly a lesson to us all. They went into an ironclad quarantine, which Venice then followed suit with. Um, they wouldn't let anyone in or out except for food and medical. Um, the same is true in, in Venice, but it just started a little bit later, but not much. Um, within five days in Vaux, they had 800 swab testing kits to test everybody in the town and then isolated everybody. And by the 23rd of March, there was no and there were no infections. And in fact, Venice followed suit in many exactly the same way. It was quite an extraordinary place. There were police um, on all the canals. There were on all the streets in Calais and they were checking. You needed to have a, a letter saying where you were going and why. Only one person from each family household was allowed to leave. Um, you were children were only allowed to leave the house if they were within 200 meters and they couldn't go beyond that. So the Venice was a very, very different place. It was very empty as well. Um, as you, you know, there's actually not, one of Venice's greatest problems is there aren't enough residents and uh, the populations declined from 150,000 thereabouts after the war to 30,000 now. So in quarantine, that, felt, that feels very small. And I'm going to try and show you some pictures because I think they really show what it was like. Um, one, of the, one of the things that struck me most was the, um, uh, 
was the silence of Venice. And I hope, can you see that video? Um, currently, everything was empty. Alex, Alex, it's not coming through currently. I don't know if it's since Kim- not. Okay, let me try. Let me try again. Let me try one more time and see what I can do. Yeah. Is it letting you share the screen because it's not showing up? Yeah, it's not showing it at all. Okay, hold on. Let's try this one more time. Am I sharing now? There we go. Yes, you are now. Good. Okay. So that's the Rialto Bridge. Um, normally you can't get by at all because uh, there are hordes of people. Um, Venice has uh, 30 million visitors per year. Um, and which for a city of only 50,000 is, is really quite a substantial difference to see it empty and then also no one to be allowed out. Venice very quickly started spraying the streets, decontaminating all the handrails. In fact, long before we even knew what coronavirus was, Francesco said they were testing temperatures at airports um, before you came in. Um, you can see there was really no one on the streets, maybe one lone person you would see occasionally going to the supermarket and back or going to, you know, the Rialto market. But, you know, these pictures are, are really fairly indicative of what it was like. I, I, I took most of these photos, a few are from friends and um, one or two from the Comune. But this, this probably photo was technically not allowed because there were two people sort of standing next to each other. I think the silence was extraordinary. And when you, you hear all the great poets who visited Venice and, and talk about it, they, they always talk about the silence of Venice. And um, I think that's, you know, not a ripple on the black translucent wave of the palace walled garden, not a cry as the gondolier with velvet or glide by. And that, that really does indicate what it was, but it was also a time of patriotism in Venice, which was great to see. Um, the rainbow symbol came out, tutto andrà bene, everything's going to be okay. Um, people had time to look at their photos. There was a photo there of Mario that you might've just seen. Um, and I'll just do another loop. And they, you know, it was a, a time where families got together. We could yell at each other across the canals um, and from balconies to balconies, we would lean out balconies and have a drink together. So in many ways, you know, Venice and the Venetians are incredibly resilient people as everyone's had to be during these times. And, um, and their spirit, although I think saddened, was not dampened. Um, Bill, are there any questions that yeah, you well, want I to, to ask specifically about it? Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask is that this experience has in a way led to, and this combined with the, the flooding in the previous fall, has led to a whole series of questions about Venice's future with respect to tourism, with respect to its economy, with respect to um, you know, perhaps diversifying its economic foundations to reviving the um, the craft industries that have been part of Venice. So given this experience of this emptiness, the absence of visitors, the uh, people there in Venice, um, in a sense, having their city back, even though at the time they couldn't really be out in the public realm and experiencing it. Um, many questions have, have come up about the future. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about where, from people you've been talking to and your connections there, uh, what you think about for the future uh, of Venice. Well, um, Venice really needs to um, redefine its, its future. And this, the, the flooding, between the flooding, the canceling of Carnivale, and then coronavirus, it's been a devastating year for for Venice. And um, and can you see me again, Bill? Sorry, I'm just trying to your, get this. We're seeing your name, but not actually. Not me. 
you know, um, it, it's, um, I'm sure all of us are familiar with the joys of technology and <laughs> the. Uh, I'm very sorry. So, okay, there we go. Um, so it, it's you know, I, um, there was a, 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 an interesting quote that I read by Mattia Berto, who has a theater company in Venice, and he said. And I think it's quite an Italian way of saying it, but he said, you know, Venice has been the perfect lover willing to give to everyone what it wants and what they want without asking for a commitment to the future. Um, but it's finally time to commit to its future. And I think what we see in Venice, we see globally, it's, uh, it's not just Venice's problem. Venice is a, a microcosm of the rest of the world. And in many ways, it, it's, a, it's a template for what we all can expect and what we all, and the challenges we all might face. You know, the, by sector, tourism is the number one contributor globally to the GDP of, you know, internationally. So um, it's, it's a huge economic factor for most countries globally. Um, and it's not always sustainable. And certainly Venice's uh, current situation is, is not a sustainable one. Um, you know, there's a paradox of mass tourism to no tourism, but they, there's an adaptation of how to find that. And there are groups like We Are Here Venice, which our good friend Jane Damoso is running and Venetian Heritage. And there are lots of local groups who have been raising their flag for years and years and trying to be heard. And I think, you know, finally between the floods and now this, um, their voice is being heard, which, which is, is much, much needed. Um, you know, one in 11 jobs um, are in tourism globally. So the problem in Venice is fit with a population of 50,000, half of those work in the tourism industry. This year, there has been absolutely no tourism. And I might just show you the floods because I don't know if people saw some photos, but I'll just see if I can share um, some photos of those as well. That'd be terrific. Um, and I'll just let you watch some of this. Mimo trovar problemas e a Fontana. The floods were six foot high. It um, covered over 80% of the entire city of Venice. And what most people don't realize is this was not a one-time event. A few days later, they were five feet high. And a few days later, they were five and a half feet high. And it continued. Um, and Venice also in this picture, that's showing an extremely low tide. Um, Venice also, in contrast to its very extremely high tides, gets uh, low tides as well, which are, can often be as detrimental. Um, they, Um, stop that. The, the, the dryness allows um, air to get into the foundations. And so therefore, when you have an extremely low tide, areas of the building in the city that have been underwater for a really long time are actually now exposed to, to, to the air, which then causes it to decay very rapidly. They estimate that um, one flood ages of building about 20 years in Venice. And if you think of the age of those buildings already, you think that with the continuing flooding that we've had this June, we had more floods, spring floods are really unusual. And we had, um, we've had five of the highest June floods uh, in history in the last 15 years. So it, it shows that the, our climate is changing, um, that we all, as a, as a united globe need to come up with solutions to find these. Um, it's a testament to Venice's structure and building typology that it has been flexible enough and resilient enough to allow for all these changes and still stand. And I think, you know, it, in terms of architecture and design, there's some serious lessons there in terms of materials and um, build construction as well that we need to think about, especially for coastal towns and possibly everywhere. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot that these issues have raised 
and they've brought it to the forefront and the, the world is finally listening. You know, it was on the cover of Vogue, which was good to raise awareness. Um, UNESCO has uh, nominated uh, Venice. It was its first World Heritage Site. And now it's on a risk register. Um, and that, you know, raises a lot of awareness and um, about how, how do you look after a city, which is a living city, and that's, it's not a Disneyland. It's, um, you know, how, how do you do that? And how do you protect the lagoon, which is an incredible ecosystem. It's the largest wetland in all of Italy. Um, to be a wetland of interest, you need 20,000 species. Uh, Venice has over, the Venice Lagoon has over 280,000 species. So um, that's an incredible, um, ecosystem, um, but because of surface water pollution, because of loss of land, air pollution, erosion from oil tankers and from cruise ships, you know, those are, those are causing serious, uh, you know, detrimental effects. And that's happening all around the world. This is not just Venice's problem alone, unfortunately. Um, but I think Venice has solutions and they know how to manage it. It's sometimes allowing the voice of the people to speak and to manage it is what um, often gets forgotten, which is ironic in Venice because the whole political structure of the Venetian Republic was on the basis of an elected, um, an, an, an elected head of state um, where, you know, the, the the voice of the people was um, the supreme power. So it, in many ways, it's sort of ironic that the voices get ignored in today's political system. But hopefully the, the horrendous uh, events of this last year will um, allow those voices to be heard and the people of Venice and the Venetians to speak out with the help of others globally who have uh, suffered similar problems and found solutions. So I think in working together, we can all find great solutions. Well, that's, that's terrific. It actually gives a kind of a renewed mission for us with our programs to make connections to these groups and organizations, something we'll be in, hoping to do even this, this fall to uh, use the, um, the student research and interests to actually start to envision how this might look in the future if some of these ideas uh, were followed through on and uh, were developed. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to your work as uh, um, in historic preservation and uh, the study. Um, and there have been several projects that you've been in, involved in. One in the study of the statuary of, uh, of Venice, which is an interesting, raises some interesting questions relative to the debates and controversy that's uh, happening now in the United States about uh, monuments and memorials and, uh, and what is recognized, but also um, more broadly in the issue of historic preservation in Venice and the Veneto and work you've done uh, at the Rotunda um, uh, in looking into, you know, the ways that we can uh, work with new technologies. These in partnership with multidisciplinary teams uh, from across the University of Virginia. So it is, it recognizes a, an extraordinary opportunity that, uh, that we have. So um, perhaps starting with that, that issue of the, you know, the, the kind of that, what you alluded to in the political history and culture of, of Venice and uh, how it gets represented in the public realm, uh, but then perhaps pivoting and moving into um, how the tools uh, that uh, you've been working with and that we've been working with at UVA uh, might give us some new ways to think about historic preservation and study uh, this history. Well, I think uh, Venice has a very interesting tradition, and what you see today is not the Venice of the Venetian Republic necessarily, because the, the Venetian Republic's tradition was that they did not allow statues of men in public spaces, because they did not believe that any voice, any one person could be greater than the voice of the people through the elected La Repubblica. So, um, most of the statues that you see in Venice today are post-Napoleonic and, um, and therefore would not have been allowed in, 
in, in Venice. Um, there are a few statues which survive, and many of them are Moors, Muslims, and women. Very few, only one, uh, Colleone, is of a, a male man seated on a horse, which is actually from the days of the Republic. Um, so other than, of course, in, in, in churches, of which you see hundreds of monuments to men, um, with paid for by themselves as well. <laughs> So I think it is notable that uh, also a lot of those statues that you see historically were used to pin petitions and grievances. There's, most people won't know it, but it, just on the, in San Marco Square, there's the, the column with the, the line of San Marco. And at the very base, there's, there's a, a small little hidden statue um, of a, a melon seller and he's selling his melons. And it was actually a place where petitions were pinned um, and grievances against the state, the Republic, uh, because of its very close proximity in San Marco were, were, were actually pinned. And this is in a time where, you know, um, mo in most countries that would have been considered treason and you would have quite clearly been executed. So I do think, uh, Venice's uh, system of allowing the voice of the people to be heard and not recognizing and glorifying uh, men for any political purpose, uh, good or bad, is an interesting, an interesting model. And um, I think something that it's worth understanding that history. And so I, I think our histories are so important to understand because we're continuously repeating our history and, and so much that's gone before has, um, has been put in place to, to make change for good. And if we can learn from those lessons of the past by understanding our histories and also sometimes not repeating those histories that I think we have a, a lot um, for the future. Um, you talked about the, uh, the recent work at, the, at the, La Rotonda, um, and I guess, uh, well, there are certainly a lot of statues on that building, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which comes from Palladio, and, uh, and actually they're all of gods and goddesses, so none of them represent actually any men. Um, and he took that example from Rome, which was also a Roman Republic, who also had a, a kind of quite interesting take on statuary and, um, and the deceased as well. Um, and if people, uh, if, if someone had, uh, basically been uh, had done something treacherous to against the state. Their, their statues were not allowed to be put up and they were dismembered the statues. <laughs> so there was, there was a certain emperor that had that happen to him. Um, and um, so that his memory would be forgotten basically. So it's interesting, statues and memory are an interesting, an interesting thing. But one of the work that um, the University of Virginia, the students of, um, and with the library and the architecture and preservation school and other architects from the school of architecture there did, which has been, I think, a really uh, incredible moment to do it because as, as we move uh, into this new world of technology <laughs> and internet access, we're looking at the virtual worlds and they did laser scans last year, so not this year, but last year they did laser scans of all of the exteriors of the rotunda. Um, so we've got down to the you know millimeter um, scans of in 3D of what the rotunda looks like, and it means that you can look at um, an access statuary on a roof that you couldn't access before, and you could actually really define who that is and why they're there. Um, and you also are able to open it and make it much more accessible to other people who can't always access it. It's, it's not a very accessible building with its stairs. And, um, and it is an opportunity to look at heritage, look at history, look at buildings, look at design, look at proportions, um, all these things which are you know, so important to how we live now um, in a kind of virtual 3D world. And I think it's an incredible testament to the work that the school is doing, that they had the foresight to, to, to work on that and to do that at such a, a, a pivotal time. So that was a, a really exciting project and we look forward to seeing kind of how that might develop and where that's going to take us. I know they've done this also 
and at the university. So, and they were doing cross comparison models of that. And so there's a lot of really interesting information that will probably come out of that, that will help make, um, make sites more accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, it's terrific to have seen that work and uh, some of the um, examples that came out of it. I don't know if you um, have a qu quick video you could share or that, that may not be, that may not be possible. Well, I tried, Bill, and I've emailed you a clip because oh. my internet connection here is not strong enough to oh, make okay. it come through clear. Okay. Um, but I don't know if you're able to open a clip or not because I would love to show that. But there, there, there are clips and I'm hoping maybe Kim can make those available to people yeah. um, afterwards um, or maybe sense. even in a link um, that they might be able to show um, yeah. because there's some amazing photography and um, yeah. Kim yeah. says she's going to be able to share it. So that's, okay, that's that great. the best way to, uh, to handle that uh, given limited time and, uh, and this conversation. Um, the, uh, one of the really exciting things about some of the issues that you're pointing to and what we're uh, you know, working with in the, in the program is just in a way how um, central these questions are to all of the questions we're dealing with in the School of Architecture now and that we're facing as a society. One of the opportunities that has, you know, starts to be discussed as, you know, another form of perhaps a different, I mean, we might think of it as a different kind of tourism, but it's almost a kind of institutionally based tourism where you're not just coming to see the sites, but that you know, thinking about ways in which, uh, you know, the, the architecture, the infrastructure, the many palazzos might provide institutional homes for groups that are researching, for instance, research on climate change, research on history, research, and that in a way Venice becomes, um, rather than the, the kind of Disneyland route, it really becomes a kind of research site and that it becomes a global hub for people working together. That's something that we would be very excited about as, a, as you know, a kind of long-term future for UVA's involvement would be that kind of long-term home in Venice where people come together and where the issues that we're facing uh, as you know globally are not abstract they're very physical they're very tangible you experience them you feel them and you're doing it in a context of a place that has been uh, wrestling with these questions uh, for uh, for many years I think that's a, a kind of a long-term goal a long-term hope and an opportunity to actually grow from you know a very deeply uh, loved and embedded program in the School of Architecture to something that actually begins to engage the entire University of Virginia and partnerships with um, with other universities I might mention we're already working in collaboration uh, with uh, MIT, who was um, the dean at MIT, was uh, putting together the Venice Biennale, uh, Architecture Biennale this year, which has been postponed until next year. And so we're engaged in a collaboration uh, with MIT uh, for next year's Architecture Biennale now, um, with a year now to uh, put a program together that involves the relationship of Venice and the, and the Lagoon. So in a way, we're beginning that kind of uh, multidisciplinary work that uh, makes it uh, more than just a student experience, but couples that student experience with uh, deep research opportunities. Um, it's been terrific to hear this. And uh, what I'd like to do is um, open up for some questions. Um, and I see we only have a, a few questions so far in the Q&A, but uh, uh, Kim, you may be um, looking through those and be able to particularly ask uh, Alex um, some more questions that may amplify some of the issues that have been brought up and whether they're uh, points of discussion. But I want to encourage people who, haven't, who have questions to use the, the Q&A to uh, engage with us and um, uh, be, and bring, the, bring additional questions to us for further discussion. Uh, yeah, so I will start. Um... Jonathan Strand has asked, how have real estate prices been in recent decades? Mm -hmm. Be a roadblock for artists and craftspeople coming back to Venice and 
what are people saying or doing about that? Yeah, and one of the big factors in that has been, you know, the impact of Airbnb and uh, foreign ownership of, uh, but uh, Alex, you may have m many more insights than I do to, uh, to that question. I, I think it's been a significant problem because uh, the residents and the shop owners, the local shop owners have been priced out of their rental accommodation uh, because there aren't enough jobs to support tourism will only pay so much. Um, and uh, there aren't, so there's not enough income to support the very high rents that um, are, are, are there in Venice because there is a lot of foreign investment in Venice. Um, and unfortunately, in even 20 years, we've seen almost all the local shops, um, which, you know, were green grocers to uh, to dry cleaners, to butchers, to bakers, all on every little cale off of most big campos in Venice had that. And now they're really a handful in each uh, sestiere. So they've disappeared. And the reason they've disappeared is they can't afford the rent. So it is, it's a significant impact. Um, saying that, uh, that's also, I know, a huge problem in a lot of places. And, you know, I think you can get uh, a small apartment with a view of the Grand Canal for, uh, for less than you can a, 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 an apartment in Brooklyn. So I think, you know, this is a global problem in a lot of urban cities. Um, so Venice, again, is not alone in that. But uh, because it's such a microcosm, of the world, it, it's it's much more readily apparent, and it it has um, also. I think as tourists, we we need to be responsible tourists as well, and um, and there's a culture, especially with cruise ships, of um, a hundred thousand people coming in. The uh, gift shops are on the cruise ship, and the food is all you can eat on the cruise ship. So there's a lot of footfall, but not a lot of not a lot of income brought into the people of Venice and to the, the people who are living and working and trying make, to make Venice accessible to everybody. So that, that makes it difficult. Um, yeah, uh, so following up a little bit on that, um, Ben has asked, there was a quote in the New York Times article, um, the most recent one, and I just linked that most recent one to our email um, out to everybody, that said, in 2012, the central government approved a law banning cruise ships from the basin and the canal to lessen overcrowding in those areas, but is yet to be enforced. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, I figure that could be bureaucratic delays, but it seems like something that could finally be realized. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's a big issue. Venice has actually banned the cruise ships many times, but uh, ports, as you will know globally, are part of a port authority, which is a national organization in, in every country. And, uh, and therefore, they are governed by different rules and regulations. And so, whereas Venice may have banned their, uh, their access, they, that's not being fulfilled by other government um, of other government bodies, so that's a struggle, a political structure, a struggle. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of money that comes in, and where that goes is um, not always into Venice directly. It can go also to the larger Veneto region, uh, which is a big region. So um, and um, so, yeah. So it it is spread. You know, I think it may be important for people who may not realize that the city of Venice is not simply the islands in the lagoon. It is also a, a big portion of the municipality of Venice is actually on the mainland. And uh, so there are these nested layers of governance uh, between the, the, the city with its set of issues, um, the islands that con constitute what we normally think of as, as Venice. Um, the Veneto, and then these port authorities, and then ultimately the um, the government of Italy. And so much of 
this requires coordination among all of those different scales for uh, it actually to be implemented as, as Alex is indicating. So it's a really complex issue. Um, and some of that complexity is also bound up in issues like the MOSE project and uh, all of the efforts to protect the lagoon uh, against uh, sea level rise in the future. It's, um, it is a very complex political situation and a whole set of nested political entities that um, require a very high level of coordination uh, in order to actually realize uh, the change that is really going to be necessary. So that's a, that's a hope for the future is that we, there can be a higher degree of coordination uh, there among these. I think the same tr holds true though. We, we see a cruise ship issues in Charleston, South Carolina. You see them throughout, you know, Antigua, Jamaica, throughout the Caribbean. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that is, um, is an important address. And I think, you know, you, you want to make places accessible to everybody, um, but equally we need to think how to do that in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. um, throughout the world. Right. Uh, and so building off of that, do you know if that if Venice has seen canal water quality improve um, since the quarantine? Do we know if there has been the Im impacts of not have it, having less tourism? So um, and I, might, I might have some videos that I can share, but uh, so a lot of people uh, said that there were dolphins. There were some video, some, some news and um, photos of dolphins in the canals. Um, unfortunately, that was not true. And in fact, the original post said exactly where it was. So I'm not sure how it became fake news so quickly, but um, you, there, one does see uh, dolphins at the mouth of the lagoon and inside the lagoon occasionally feeding. So it, uh, dolphins are around, but inside the canals is, is often quite rare. Um, in terms of the water quality, um, Venice has worked really hard to get the water quality improved. Um, and I think what was noticeable was the silt and, um, and the lack of boat traffic. And it's incredible the erosion that's caused by that and also the stirring of sediment which makes it the, the water very unclear and murky um, quite beautiful at times um, the colors obviously but it means it's not that crystal clear blue but it, it's a very salty water generally and it's so hugely tidal that you're never going to get sort of crystal clear blue water there there are a lot of fish already um in fact i was trying to get the video to link but you know we caught a seagull who caught a huge sea bass you know about that big in the canal right in front of us and so uh certainly the the, the birds uh the birds are taking back the, the, the city a little, a little bit and you've got ducks nesting and cranes and there's so the birds from the lagoon are coming much much closer in and um, I just I wonder if I can share I'm going to try and share this I don't know if it's going to work so I'm going to try and pull it up um, this is from let's see if it will work um, this what I want to share if I can get it to work is um, Venice in Peril did a recording of sounds on the uh, lagoon during lockdown and it was really really beautiful and I am just gonna see if this will work hold on bear with me one sec I've had to use a new device and um, my technological skills are coping. Um, so share content, screen, start broadcast. And let's see if I can get in there quickly. Okay, I don't know if you can see this and hear it. Is sound coming through or no? Yes. Some is. Of the water, can you hear the water coming through? It's not. Mm -hmm. Okay. But 
but this most incredible sound of the forkala groaning against its own wood in the water. And you can hear the black-headed gulls um, who change color. They, 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 their heads change color at, this, at the time of year uh, during the lockdown. And you can hear them uh, continually. So it, made, it certainly made one realize how much uh, noise pollution there is and how, how quickly nature does want to come back and, and take over. Um, we are here, Venice has been tracking pollution levels um, from the, um, from the canals in different places across the city. And they've certainly noticed a, um, a huge uh, amount of, um, uh, a decrease in the pollution levels. Venice is a funny city because of the canals and the wind and you get pockets of pollution that sort of swirl and whirl around it and hit it in, any, in many areas. And most cities are like that. You know, in fact, here in London and the Gherkin, because of its sort of um, round elliptical shape, um, you know, it created vortex of wind around it, which then uh, the wind swirled and swirled and swirled around. And it actually created a vacuum, which sucked out some windows on the top floor in the early stages of the design. Um, so, you know, these wind patterns and uh, are, are very interesting. And you get pockets in cities, um, certainly where pollution levels are much, much higher than in others. So going back to sort of Palladio's uh, view of the world where you have to build buildings with uh, proper ventilation and access to air is certainly really good design principles today and something we need to kind of consider as we go forward. Um, Emily had a question about the Biennale and I know Bill, you already addressed that it will, it has been postponed until next year, right? 2021. Um, yeah. And I didn't know if you wanted to add anything else you touched upon a little bit uh, about the presentation and if there was anything else you wanted to add to that. I might, there, it's actually a, an interest, I'll say a couple things just about our collaboration then maybe Alex would like to expand on that with respect to what's happening with the, the Biennale, which is in a way one of those institutions within Venice that, um, really takes advantage of the extraordinary um, you know, nature of the city and brings uh, people from around the world uh, for uh, different purposes. It's been actually one of those great experiences of our uh, being there with the students with our programs, whether it's the art, art year or the architecture year to be able to participate and to view and to be involved in, in the Biennale in some form. Uh, what's interesting in this conversation is back in 2007, uh, the Venice program was led by a um, junior faculty member at UVA, Nicholas DeMoncho, who did a body of work on Venice that he's continued to explore as part of his own research. He left UVA and went to Berkeley, and now he has gone to MIT as the chair of architecture at MIT. And so it's really through that connection of a faculty member who was introduced to Venice through UVA and has continued to do work there, who is now circling back around and uh, working with Julie and me uh, on uh, and uh, architects in Venice, uh, Sandro Biza, who has worked with us um, uh, in the program uh, since then as well, uh, to uh, get involved in this. And part of the goal there is really to help people who come to Venice to understand this larger relationship to the lagoon. If you come to the city, you come to the Biennale, you come to visit the monuments of the city. Many people come in, come out, and are never aware of this deeper relationship and the larger ecosystem that it's part of. And so that's really the, the goal of what we're working on for next year is how to expand that awareness of Venice in its larger setting. Alex, do you wanna, is there anything you wanna talk about the, the discussions around the Biennale in general that you've uh, been aware of or part of? I mean, I think the, the Biennale is just an extraordinary place um, to let ideas and art shape our ideas and form art and architecture um, to shape how we plan our future. And there have been some wonderful 
wonderful shows that have gone on that UVA has been involved with. And certainly some of the students have been interns um, in the past in the Biennale, which has been great that they've had that opportunity. And it's a bringing together of the world um, to look at art and the future of art in, in, the, in their own ways without being dictated to. Um, but in terms of what what they have to do or include or produce um and in many ways i think that's a really nice model on how we all need to come together in 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 not just architecture but in ecology climate medicine you know it i think venice is a really great uh, a place for those great thoughts to happen and to bring people together so um the binale is you know a perfect example of how to do that yeah, you, know, you just you meant just mentioned one thing that I would love to um, just mention to people in case they aren't aware that last uh, spring a year ago uh, we had a large gathering uh, in Vicenza as part of the university's 200th uh, anniversary, uh, done in a collaboration between the architecture school and the school of medicine, and involving the University of Padua, involving uh, uh, architects and friends uh, from. Uh, the from Vicenza and from Venice uh, that was a uh, you know opened up an extraordinary set of possibilities and I think opened the university's eyes to what might be possible with this kind of multidisciplinary collaboration and I might just add one more note about the Biennale is it's also an extraordinary opportunity for our students because part of the Biennale of course takes place at the Arsenale and in the, uh, the gardens in the Giardini but they also make use of many of uh, the palazzi around uh, and one you know many palazzos around the city which offers an opportunity for students to um, see places that may not otherwise uh, be open or through our own networks, UVA networks and Valmarana family networks, the students get into many places that they would not be able to otherwise, but the Biennale expands that uh, accessibility for the students as well to be able to explore places that are opened up to the public for the art or architecture exhibits. So uh, in addition to our more direct participation in other ways. So it's a, it is a great example of a kind of global gathering around a set of issues that raises deep questions and uses the, uh, the resources of the city to um, highlight uh, issues in art, architecture, in society, and culture that uh, that we can certainly participate in. Uh, well, so we have just maybe like one more question, and then I'll uh, leave it to you guys to put any final thoughts that you might have. Um, James had a question about what is the status of Malcontenta and just overall on some of the, the villas that have been there during this time. I mean, how, how is everybody, how's the Rotunda doing? I would love to hear um, uh, just a little quick updates on what it's been like. Alex? Uh, very empty, <laughs> I think, is the, is the, is the, the best answer. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, without visitors, there have been very, nobody's been allowed to visit until very recently. Um, and so it's very, been empty, homes are empty without people in them. And, uh, and visitors uh, still fill all of, all of these homes in, in a different way, but in, in many positive ways as well. And uh, they've been missed. Mm -hmm. No, and yeah, I might just just mention that those those visits and those study tours that we've had both through the Venice and the Vicenza programs over the years have been an essential part of the um, the the program and of the education. And so we do hope that when we resume, we can continue to uh, in, involve and be engaged with uh, all of these sites in Venice and the Veneto that have been so critical to the education of the, of the students. That's been the saddest part is that so many great educational op and opportunities have had to be canceled, but um, mm -hmm. we, everyone's trying to open new doors and new avenues in different ways like the rest of the world is doing. Um, so, and hopefully soon we'll be all together again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and opportunities like this allow us to reach out to a bunch of alums and friends that we don't get to see all the time. So I want to thank everybody who uh, joined us today. And, um, 
And we will share uh, some more resources and uh, ways that everyone can get more involved. And we will be hosting more talks um, around the next Veneto, hopefully conversations and, uh, you know, ways that we can be rethinking and, and helping the school and Venice um, dream up a, of a brighter, bigger future. Um, Alex, Bill, anything else to add? Um. I would just particularly like to thank Alex for joining us today, for the Valmorana family more broadly, for their extraordinary um, engagement with the school and uh, making all of this possible for, uh, for us and so many generations of students who have uh, benefited from this experience. And to thank alums both here on the, on the call and uh, others um, who have been uh, great supporters of the program over the years. And uh, we look forward to continuing to brainstorm with you about uh, the future of the programs and uh, to, uh, you know, whether you were able to be there last fall at the Rotunda for the extraordinary event that uh, Kim and the university and the school's uh, advancement staff and foundation staff put together along with much coordination and work with the Valmorana family. Um, whether it's events like that, future alumni programs and trips that might uh, engage with students and the long-term engagement of UVA in Venice and the Veneto. We really appreciate every, the work that everybody's done to make this, this possible. Alex, uh, leave you the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I, for, I just want to say thank you so much for having me and talking to me about Venice and letting me talk to you about what we, we saw in Venice. Um, I hope I'll be able to welcome you all in Venice sometime soon. And I, instead of ending on my words, I'm going to end on my friend Jane DeMost, those words, who's head of We Are Here Venice. Um, she says, Venice is a mirror on the world, um, a source of inspiration and a microcosm of the most important global challenges. And I think, you know, we welcome everybody to join us in Venice to help fight these global challenges. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.